Pinkerton. Yeah. Like a little boy. Yeah, I forget. That's kind of so crazy. I mean, we have my body. It was only a few bucks. Yeah. It's a uh, it's Pacific yeah. Theater, so it's all the from Pacific Theater. So it's got B-17s, B-29. Most of the bombers are B-25 and B-26 on there. <laughs> All right, so McClellan had the Pinkertons. What was what were the two ships, the two ironclads? Merrimack and Monitor. Merrimack and the Monitor. Yeah, Merrimack and the Monitor. And the Monitor meant war from now on. The most, more and more, the most important facet of war is going to be war. Yeah, technology and industry. Very good. It, it would change everything. Change everything about war. But you still got to fight the things. That didn't work at all. Just imagine that worked. Okay. I'm recording it. I'm like 10 steps ahead of you people. Okay, so. Let's review very quickly. We're not going to go on Antietam. We already watched a very good movie on that. But this is right where we quit, right? McClellan got right to the gates of Richmond. Who was wounded at Fair Oaks? Who? Yeah, Joseph E. Johnson. He was wounded. Who did Davis replace him with? And Lee's army was called the? Well, Lee did the only thing he knew what to do. These, it's going to be called the seven days. Seven days of battle at the end of June, into July. And I'm going to just imagine this being the Union Army. The Union Army was like this. Pretty cool, huh? What Lee did is he took almost all his forces and attacked right here, the flank of the Union Army, on that first day. It didn't go well. Same deal as at Farrell. Big armies, men got lost, orders were misplaced. The Confederates were beaten back. But McClellan, think about what McClellan, McClellan is thinking. Oh my goodness, he attacked. What's going to happen to me? Yeah, I'm going to be overwhelmed. And so, despite the advice of his best generals, McClellan, they actually won, and he pulled back. That was a mechanics though. They pulled back again. Here. Same thing happened. The Confederates were beaten back that second of the seven days battle. And McClellan kept retreating. In fact, he retreated. It was such a haphazard retreat that he almost lost his army. Eventually, after seven days, they retreat almost to the James River. To give you an idea of the folly that McClellan was going through, the last battle right here at Malvern Hill, the Confederates were slaughtered. 
and McClellan still retreated. The seven days turned the tide of the war. Now, we'll get to this a little bit, but in the West, the Union had some victories along the Mississippi River. And they're at the gates of Richmond. It looks like the war is almost over. And the next thing you know, they're retreating in disarray. Everything changed for the seven days. And Lee went from being old Granny Lee to be a legend. This made Lee's reputation. He attacked an army twice as big as he was, with his capital on his back, and pushed them all the way to the gates. In fact, there was a place called Harrison's Landing. McClellan literally ran away to there and was bottled up there. Lincoln, in the end of July, was beside himself. McClellan wouldn't move. He was stuck right there. That's where Lincoln said, well, if you're not going to use your army, can I borrow it? But McClellan, this is Harrison's Landing. McClellan refused to follow orders. Lincoln actually went down there three weeks after the battle, went to Harrison's Landing to beg McClellan move, do something. And McClellan proceeded to lecture Lincoln on what a bad president he was. It's mind-boggling. And McClellan, or Lincoln, was actually pretty worried. What if he did fire McClellan? And McClellan took his army and marched to Washington, D.C. and told his room. McClellan was hinting, in fact, McClellan said to Lincoln, we need a dictator. And you imagine what Lincoln's thinking, McClellan would be that dictator. What a scary time. What Lincoln did, though, is he gathered troops from other places and just kind of took troops from McClellan and made a new army under a new general. A guy had won a victory in the Pacific, the Pacific wow, wrong war, in the Mississippi named John Pope. Pope was arrogant, a braggart, I guess a lot of generals are. He won a minor victory, taking an Island, Confederate Island Corps called Island Number 10 on the Mississippi. So he won a victory, and Lincoln just looked for somebody who won. And Pope arrived and immediately announced he's going to go march on Richmond, destroy the Capitol, and hang every rebel before he ever fought a battle. And Link and Lee, back at Harrison's Landing, surrounding McCall, immediately labeled him the mystery. Have you ever heard that term before? Think about somebody who is totally immoral and evil. That's what that's what Lee, the miscreant Pope. And Pope and Pope advanced into Virginia towards Richmond with McClellan's now smaller army, still so Harrison's landing. And Lincoln, I'm sorry, Lee did something looking back at it that just amazing. Lee totally left McClellan on his own. And took his entire army to defeat Pope. Lee understood McClellan's not going to do anything. Not going to do anything. I mean, McClellan would have moved right, but he could take it Richmond without hardly firing a shot. But what did McClellan do? Nothing. And so, we're leading to another battle, conveniently named after the first battle, the second Bull Run or second Manassas. It's fought on the same battlefield. It's a lot bigger battle, it's a lot more confusing. If you go to this battlefield, it's basically two parts. It's a small one for the smaller first bull run, and then it's a really confusing second bull run. Lee outmarched, got behind Pope, Pope retreated. It's a whole series of mistakes by Pope, not understanding where Lee's army was. I can't go into all the details of the battle, except for this. It would be another Confederate victory. Another Confederate victory. I mean, Lee only had about 50,000 men, and Pope had 70,000. But, oh, I forgot something. To give you an idea how ferocious the seven days were, in seven days of fighting, 36,000 men went down. 36,000. About 20,000 were Confederates, killed, wounded, or missing. Okay, that's horrific. The battle's getting bloody. But in the second bull run, which was basically two days of fighting, 27,000 men went down. Obviously, you don't need to know the exact numbers. I'm just trying to give you an idea of how bloody these things were. They're still using Revolutionary War tactics with relatively modern weapons. Fortunately, they saw them going out high explosives. That would come two years after the Civil War. Still, awful. After the Second Bull Run, maybe, well, we're not going to have time to talk. Um, 
Now I'll say it. Maybe the best Union general of the war was killed, Bill Carney. Carney, just a fighter. He was one of the generals who said in the Seven Days, why are we retreating? He begged McClellan to attack. He fought with the French Foreign Legion in, in Algeria in the 1840s, and that's how he lost his arm. Just a great fighter. He's one of these guys that could have been commander, who knows? Maybe ended the war sooner and saved thousands of lives. At Arlington Cemetery, he'd be reinterned there. I'll talk about Arlington at the end of the unit, at the end of the Civil War. But it has a big marker for his body, and it's very interesting because right next to it is a crypt of over 13,000 bodies, unknown soldiers they couldn't identify from all the fighting around Richmond. Give you an idea of the carnage. Pope was fired. Yeah. Wait, did he die in the seven day siege? No, he, he died. He died in Tekka Bora. In fact, he died right at the end of the battle, and he was riding out to go check on the Confederate advance. He still wanted counterattack. And when he's riding back to the Union lines, and near, it was just starting to get dark, Confederate or Union pickets, so these are Union soldiers and scouts, saw a shadowy figure and a few other men riding out of them. What did they do? Yeah. And the open fire. Killed their own man. This will happen again on the other side. This happens all the time. Pope fired. After they sent Pope to Minnesota to fight the Yankton Sioux, Pope's gone. They need a new commander. Why do they need a new commander? Lee, down to less than 40,000 men. Half of them did not have shoes. But he thought, we must be the best soldiers in the world. After the seven days and second bull run, Lee invaded the North. One big victory would get who into the war? Okay, this is right before Antietam. You remember that in the video. Lee invaded the North to get who into the war? What two countries? England. Yeah, especially Britain. If Britain entered the war, the France, the French Empire, and Napoleon III would have entered too. He thought he could get a victory. Even 40,000 men, he knew it would be outnumbered, but he thought we're invincible. He could do this again before Gettysburg. Hope is gone, and this is when Lincoln had no idea. By then, almost all the troops from Harrison Landing are in Washington, D.C. Reinforcements are coming. He needs somebody to stop Lee. <clears throat> Who's he pick? McClellan. McClellan's back in command. Now this is, I know I got a little bit off whack because I had to show that video, or I had to show a, a video on Wednesday. But McClellan's back in command, and we're leading to the bloodiest day in American history. The Battle of Antietam. It's Antietam Creek, there's a little town there called Sharpsburg, so it's also called Sharpsburg, but to me it's Antietam. And that's just coming out of the cornfield, one of the three main sectors of that battle. Cornfield, Bloody Lane, and what was the bridge? Do you remember the name of the bridge? Named after the general who tried to take it? It's looking at you. It's right here. I brought the bridge for you. Burnside. This is what we're watching the video. So this show on that video we watched on Wednesday. And McClellan, do you remember how McClellan knew where Lee's army was? Lee rather foolishly divided his army up into four units. Lee thought, I have a lot of time. He divided them up partially to take Harper's Ferry, but also go into Pennsylvania to get supplies. Steal them. How did McClellan know where Lee was? Huh? Yeah, he found the battle plans. One of Lee's staff members wanted a souvenir of this glorious victory. So he made a copy of Lee's plans, how he divided his forces up, and wrapped it around something he thought he would never lose. Three cigars. Put it in his pocket. Three cigars. They fell out. The Union Army camped in the same spot two days later. And one sergeant found these cigars. Like, hey, cigars! They're really hard to find in the North. Fortunately, he looked at paper wrapped around it, and it was the plans. And shockingly, McClellan agreed. These are the real plans. He did something. McClellan now knew if he moves, he can get between Lee's divided force. So what did McClellan do? Move really slowly. 
So he allowed Lee to get his army together. And that's why Antietam, he had a chance the day before this battle. Antietam would be a confusing battle, three basic parts, and this is what we saw in the video. Three parts. The bloody first part of the cornfield. He actually had a pretty good plan, McClellan did, but he ended up being three separate parts. And then they attacked here in the middle, and there was a sunken road. Does anybody remember what that sunken road was called? It was a lane. Hmm? It's bloody lane. Erosion made it to like a six, about a four or five foot deep little trench where the road went. It's still there. If you go there today, you can go into the bloody lane. And then Burnside's Bridge. This is what the cornfield looked like. A photographer by the name of Matthew Brady sent his cameraman up here to take pictures with it the day, the two days after the battle. And so the bodies are here bloating in the September sun. And nobody had ever seen pictures like this, ever, ever. It became a sensation. No one realized how awful it was. Most people had very dramatic painting, but they'd never seen pictures like this. That's at Dunford Church outside the cornfield. Here is Bloody Lane, what it looks like today. That's what it looked like the day after the battle. One Union regiment kept fighting, trying to take it. One regiment or one brigade did finally break through, but they weren't reinforced. If you look at this map, I got this slide there. The Irish made of Irish immigrants. That was the symbol of Ireland in the heart. It was led by a man who had fled in fled Ireland back in 1848 because the Brits wanted his head. They wanted his head. He's got invented the Irish flag based on the French flag. Who was the commander? Big statue of him there at Bloody Lane. Thomas Francis Marr. Where's Marr? Well, where's his statue at? Right in front of the capital. He'd be the second territorial governor of Montana. Thomas Francis Marr. That's his flag, the Irish Brigade. And then this is Burnside's Bridge. And Burnside, named after him, he kept, he kept attacking off this bridge. And it's only about eight feet wide. And there were just a few hundred Confederate troops keeping 14,000 Union troops from taking it. Because he refused to go just a quarter mile off the river. They could have crossed Antietam Creek and not got their knees wet. But he just kept sending men over. So by the time they got over, it's too late in the day. They did take the bridge, be named after him, but it was kind of a failure. At the end of the day, the very thin Union or Confederate lines held. Burnt or uh, McClellan did not even use a third of his soldiers. He kept them reserved because he thought he was what? He thought he was outnumbered. Why would you not use your troops then? Hmm? Why would you not use your troops then? He thought he was outnumbered. He needed reserves. If you would have used those troops energetically at, like, let's say, Bloody Lane in the middle of the day, they could have ended the war right there. Because to ease back was the Potomac. He couldn't, he couldn't retreat. They could have ended the war right there. Lee was able to retreat, but at the end of the day, it was enough of a Union victory because they held the battlefield. But first off, let me tell you how bloody it was. One day of fighting. One day. Almost 27,000 casualties. One day. One day. Just under 14,000 were union casualties. Just over 3,000 died. It's the most Americans have died in one day in American history. Now, in special topics, we're doing a unit on September 11th. That's one thing great about special topics. We do kind of you know, we, do, we did 20 gangsters, which was kind of fun, but also pretty serious units. We did a you know, more all the details of not, uh, September 11th. I remember that afternoon, I was in that classroom next to us, Mr. Fugar's classroom. Then I, I wanted this room. And they were talking, they had no idea how many people were still in the Twin Towers. They had no idea. And so they were thinking maybe 10, 11, 12,000 people were dying. Fortunately, there weren't a lot of people brought out, not many people were in the building because it was before work started, and it turned out to be less than 3,000. 
So September 11th is the second bloodiest day in the history. The uh, second day of Gettysburg. Antietam is still the bloodiest day. And so, Burnside's Bridge. But a couple things about this really quick. It was enough of a victory for Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. And the Emancipation Proclamation, he issued it right after the battle. But it would not take effect. It would not take effect till January 1st. He gave the Confederates three months to quit the war and come back into the Union. By Antietam, after the seven days, Lincoln realized fighting for Union was not enough. He needed to widen the war. But it would be too controversial and divisive to go to Congress to ask for an amendment to free the slaves. Eventually that would happen, but not yet. And so what he did is he issued the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation as a pure wartime measure to hurt the Confederacy. And what it said was this. If the revolution is still going on, the rebellion is still going on, on January 1st, all slaves, that's where we have to get down, all slaves in areas held by the Confederacy, all slaves in areas held by the Confederacy are free. It did not touch slaves in areas controlled by the Union or for that matter. Good question, because on January 1st, who did it free? So, so the Confederates said you're free now? I guess you're free now. It's symbolic. It frees nobody unless these areas are what? Taken back into the Union. They will not be free unless the Union wins. It's a brilliant political move. It did not touch the slaves in places like Kentucky that stayed in the Union. But it turned the war from a war for union to a war for union and freedom. And once it became a war for freedom, answer your question, once it became a war for freedom, the slaves are free. You can't stop halfway. If the United States wins, they have to free all the slaves. You can't just simply say, hey, let's go fight and die and keep some slaves. No. Slavery is over. It will end. It made it a symbolic issue. But it did two other things, too. This is really important. Once it became a war for freedom, who's never going to enter the war now? What country will never enter the war? Britain. Britain's off. Britain will not enter this war. When it was just about union, Britain, yeah, you only thought about it. But once it became a war about freedom, Britain can't do it. So that's the second reason. Everyone got that? Britain. Third reason. Once you have an Emancipation Proclamation, who can be in your army? Yeah, free slaves and blacks. There weren't that many. There weren't that many uh, people of African descent in the north, but in areas that they got back to the Union, thousands of contrabands came to the Union lines, and now they can be recruited for the army. By the end of the Civil War, one out of every ten U.S. soldiers were black. Most of them were descendants of slaves or former slaves. That would be decisive in winning the war. Decisive. It would have been hard for the United States to win without those brave soldiers. At first, they did mostly just work behind the line, and but eventually they would be allowed to fight. They had white officers, white sergeants. They were paid less, but they were desperate to prove they deserved to be citizens too. And once you have black soldiers, you can't turn around and say, "By the way, you're not free. You can't go back." The Confederates saw that right away. That's why you have this Confederate cartoon of it. And who's holding Lincoln's ink well? Slave rebellion. They said this is inciting slave rebellion. And so there would be a lot of black units. The most famous would be the 54th Massachusetts. They'd be the first black unit to enter combat in a full time. Over half would be killed or wounded trying to take a fort near Charleston, South Carolina in 1863. And there is a very good movie that's, wow, it's nearly 30 years old. It seems weird to think about. Called Glory. Some of you might have seen it. It's very good. I am going to 
give you a list of movies you can pick one to watch for a little bit of extra credit over Christmas break, and Glory will be one. I highly recommend it. It's a good movie. It has a very young Denzel Washington in it. And a younger Morgan Freeman. That's a great one. So, McClellan, yes. Yeah, some days they're called Zouaves. Yeah, they're copied after French colonial troops are really powerful and bright. No difference. McClellan refused to follow, right? Because he's McClellan. What else could he do? And Lincoln fired him in the middle of the night. He sent his general, or he sent his adjutant to go fire him, thinking that McClellan, it is, during the day McClellan's army might rise up and march on Washington. McClellan would not do that. Despite all his flaws, he was not a traitor. McClellan gave up, and Lincoln didn't know who to give the command to, so he ordered the man who took the bridge, Ambrose Burnside. And Ambrose Burnside would be the new commander of the Army of the Potomac. Burnside did not want it. Lincoln ordered him. Now, Burnside pitcher would become the most popular pitcher of all Union generals. It's a very... It was a very in thing to do to have all the generals have their pictures on the walls. And Burnside's was the most, especially among the women. Now, I'm reluctant to show you his picture because some of you might swoon him, right? But here we go. <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. I, 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 yeah, you know. What's going to be named after him? Cyburn. Burnside's in the 1870s, they got reversed into Cyburn. It's named after Ambrose Burnside. Because everybody wanted to copy his distinctive facial hair. <laughs> now, Jamie brought up a good point. Who can you dress up with on December 17th? <laughs> you can dress up as who? <laughs> Calhoun or I don't know, Raul, or Ambrose Burnside. Now, I know what a lot of you are thinking. That's totally unfair. I know. But it's so much fun. Alex has already informed me that he is going to shave his head for this. <laughs> you shave your head, glue it on here, we got burn time. <laughs> yeah, that's your two choices. Now, we will do it again in the 20, or we will do it again in May. And in the May is any character from the 20th century as long as I prove it so it just but but for this it's only Burnside and Calhoun. Yes. How much extra credit is I've given a lot. So if you really go all out I've given as many as 50 points. Now if you just kinda if you just kinda make your hair all crazy and show up with a suit jacket, okay that won't <laughs> but yeah. Doesn't mean I will. But I've given a lot. If you really go all out, one girl three years ago did it split her split in half. And one side she was burnt, saturated, right to here, and the other side she was Calhoun. So her hair was all wild here. She had like a fake ball thing. For it was it was one of the most amazing costumes I've ever seen. Hundred points she had. It's two. Okay, so <laughs> Burnside. This is Northern Virginia. Why do I put this map up here? Arrows. <laughs> Here's Washington, D.C. Richmond is down here. And Cheatham was up here. By the time Burnside took command, Lee is here, Burnside is here. There's a big river called the Rappahannock. Great name, huh? Rappahannock. Come here, little Rappahannock. Come here, little Jabonka back. Okay, so. <laughs> Burnside knew I was given the command to attack, and even though it was winter, he was going to attack. And his plan was that November, it's a good plan, to take his army here and now reinforce to over 100,000 men again. The Union had a lot more soldiers. Move very quickly here at a place called Fredericksburg, cross the river, get behind Lee's army, and win a victory there. It's a good plan. And it almost worked. Middle of November, he marched here, and Lee didn't realize it. He stole a march on Lee. Got to Fredericksburg. Something wasn't there that he had ordered to meet him there. Bridges. Pontoon bridges. They weren't there yet. 
He had to wait three weeks for the bridges. By the time the bridges arrived, who else arrived? Lee. And fortified the hills around Fredericksburg. Burnside, though, didn't know what else to do, so he attacked anyways. <laughs> Thus we're leading to one of the battles that the very name, the very name would shape Union soldiers. It's called Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg. December 11, 1863. Cold. You know, around 30 to 35 degrees, really humid, just a top cold day. And Burnside never should have done this. Lee couldn't believe he attacked him. In fact, Lee looked at, I can't believe I'm so lucky. He's attacking me. Go back here. <coughs> There's these hills overlooking it. You can't get past Fredericksburg without going through these hills. Lee just had his men dig trenches. If you go there today, the trenches are still there. You can walk along those Confederate trenches, even though there's a lot more trees there now, too. And then there's a sunken road, like an Antietam and a stone brick, or a stone fence. So it's like a fort right in front of this. Terrible place to attack. And then in between Fredericksburg and the hill is over 200 yards of sloping flat, just slightly slope in ground with no cover, no trees. So any Union force has to march over a quarter mile, almost, of open ground, where they're easy targets. Never should have attacked, Burnside attacked him anyways. There was a diversion here that almost worked. Ironically, that one broke through, but it's a diversion. The main attack, 70,000 men attacked right here. And you can probably guess what happened. By the way, that's a pontoon bridge. Have you ever seen one of these? It's basically that little rafts. And you anchor them down and put roads over, or put planks over them, you have a floating bridge. They're as old as, uh, as there's been armies. The Emperor Xerxes put one over the Darden, over, over the Bosphorus. There's my little bit of trivia for you. Where's the Bosphorus? You know, I'll show you. Right between Turkey and their concept of what the example was. You're supposed to say, wow, the first one didn't work. If the water was like, um, the water um, washed away the pond and bridge. So Xerxes had his men flog the water. Okay, so there is my little tidbit of story from ancient history. Fredericksburg, that is a picture. Suppose you're looking down, you can see the black ground, the Union artillery, or the Confederate artillery, and it was a slaughter. It's December, shortened days. They attacked right where the sun was coming up. And they lined up in these long rows back here from their march up the hill. Well, you can imagine what happened. Confederate artillery first shot, solid shot. They cannonballed. They don't explode, but they couldn't miss. And you know what a cannonball is going to do to a body, right? And then as they got closer, they shot exploding shells. We didn't do a lot of damage, but still exploded, black powder. And then what is that called? We basically had a little cylinder full of canister, which is like grape shot. And they just blew holes, knocking down 10, 20, 30 men at a time, just crushing them. As they went up the hill, there's no cover. The British men just started falling. They couldn't go any further. The first line got to about 50 yards. And they seemed to start crawling back, dead and wounded everywhere. What was the only cover for the Union soldiers? Bodies, they had to hide behind bodies. And then Burnside ordered more men up, and more men up. There's stories of wounded men, dying men, kind of reaching out, don't go, it's a slaughter. A couple of places got to within 20 feet of the Confederate line, and that's it. They were literally cut down in lines. Burnside, by the afternoon, realized the attack's failure. He was going to lead one final charge from horseback. He did not lack courage, because he would have been dead for sure. Everyone's going to name it the guy on the horse. But they pulled him off. He was not killed. But at the end of the day, at the end of one day, almost 13,000 Union soldiers went down. Killed, wounded, or missing. Only about 5,000 Confederates. What a slaughter. One day, for the rest of the war, Everybody's going to talk about Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg. You just had to say the name. And it's like, oh, Fredericksburg. 
and everybody wanted to be on the like what the Confederates did in trenches and let them attack. That became the goal for everybody. You get in trenches and let them attack and you mow them down. Well, at that night, there are all these dead and wounded men lying in this big field. And a few brave men went out to bring them water and try to bring some back, but it was a little freezing, a lot froze to them. And one of the things that men remembered the next day, it was a surreal scene. The next morning, as the sun came up, the whole field was filled with naked men. The Confederates were so short of clothing and gear that they went out in the middle of the night and stole their uniforms. So you have the Confederates behind the sunken or behind the stone wall in blue. I don't blame them, I guess. But that made it even more just ghoulish, macabre. Burnside retreated, and needless to say, Burnside only had another month left in command of the army. So we've gone through a general we didn't mention, McDowell at Bull Run, then McClellan, then Pope, then McClellan, now Burnside. What was going on in the West? Western theater. I want to talk about the mud march, Western theater. In 1862 in the West, things were a lot different. A lot different. It's a war of rivers. The big river, of course, was the Danube. They could take the Danube and control the Austrian Empire. There's no doubt. No, the Danube. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Let me get back to Xerxes. No. The rivers, I think you all know the big river. What river is this? What river is this? The Mississippi River. And the Mississippi River is the river that the Union Army won. If they, the Army and the Navy could take the Mississippi River, that cuts the South into two. And the most important commercial city in New Orleans, I mean, sorry, in the Confederacy was New Orleans. But there are two other rivers that are really important. Two other rivers. The ten, excuse me, the Tennessee and the Cumberland. They get those rivers, they're like highways into the heartland of the South. The Tennessee, the Cumberland, the Mississippi. It was right here at island number 10. They literally count the, the islands on the Mississippi River south of the Ohio. So island one, I think it goes up to 42. This is what Pope took an island right here. That's how we got famous. Well, first off, the Union Navy was part of what was the Union plan to slowly blockade and strangle the South? The Anaconda Plan. Remember the Anaconda Plan? Part of the Anaconda Plan was a blockade. And they were blockading the really important city of New Orleans. The commander of the Union fleet at New Orleans was a Virginian, 64 year old David Farragut. Farragut was a tough, ornery sailor, had been in the Navy since he was a little kid. That's back when you learned how to be a sailor while 12 or 13 years old, he'd stick you on a ship. He stayed loyal to his country, and he along with a few troops, decided to take New Orleans. Down here are a couple of forts, the United States built. The Confederates basically thought, we occupy these forts. No Navy can chug up to New Orleans. To New Orleans, we can protect New Orleans. Farragut, in the middle of the night, just had his ships slip past in the middle of the night. One got sunk, but 30 got passed. The Confederates were like, you cheated. You weren't supposed to do that. There was no troops defending New Orleans. Farragut's Navy just chugged up the river meanders. So it was about 100 miles on the, on the meandering river. But it's, they just arrived off of New Orleans. Here we are. And they basically gave an ultimatum to the mayor of New Orleans. Surrender or we burn the town down. How do you burn the town down? Anyone know how you do that with solid cannonballs? They wouldn't put them in oil because that might blow up in the cannon. But that's bad for the morale of the sailors. You put them in a forge, though. Every ship had a forge for a blacksmith. You get them red hot. They're obviously using tongs. You put them in the cannonball, or you put them in the cannon, that combined with the black powder on it will burn in the It's kind of dangerous. Red hot cannonball next to gunpowder. Once again, bad for morale. And New Orleans surrendered, and boom. For the rest of the war, New Orleans would be protected by the Union. This was huge. 
This actually happened in April of 1862. So I'm kind of backtracking. When this happened, McClellan is just advancing toward Richmond. This is part of the reason why they thought, we're going to win this war. It's over. And then in the north, along the Mississippi River, another big victory. And this time led by an unlikely man, Ulysses S. Grant. Now put two pictures of Grant up. When Grant became famous, Harper's Magazine put this guy up. To this day, no one knows who this is. <laughs> but it's not Grant. That is actually Grant's first photograph, and he hated it because he thought he looked like a pirate. So every picture afterward, he's going to have a very trimmed beard. Ulysses S. Grant. A couple of things about Grant. He did go to West Point. His father was able to finagle him a, finagle him a, a an appointment. And when he got there, Grant was not the type of man to complain. And so his name was not Ulysses S. Grant. That's not his name, given name. His name was Hiram Ulysses Grant. Hiram Ulysses. But for some reason, they made a mistake in the paperwork, and they put his name as Ulysses S. Grant. And he didn't say anything. Now, there's a couple reasons why. First off, he maybe just wasn't the type to complain. But secondly, the initials. U.S. Grant sounded good. United States Grant. But there's something else with initials. Okay, they each have a chest for all their good by their bed. And they would put the initials of each cadet on it. So think about the initials. USG. I think Hiram Ulysses Grant. He didn't want to be hugged. <laughs> so he stuck with that. In fact, his nickname was Sam. I don't know how they got Sam. But he would be ironically one of two presidents in American history, two presidents, to have the middle name as simply the letter S. Two presidents. Anyone know the other one? Harry Truman. Harry S. Truman. No, the S stands for S. And so Grant was given command of an army in northern or western Kentucky. Right here. And Grant, almost on his own initiative, decided to take two forts, two really important Confederate forts, Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. Then I'll put it right. Fort Henry on the Tennessee, Fort Donaldson on the Cumberland. Henry and Donaldson. Two Confederate forts. The U.S. Navy had just had built some gunboats. If you look at those ships in front, they were ironclad gunboats. They called them turtles. So they kind of vaguely look like a turtle. They weren't quite as powerful as they had hoped. But the plan was, they thought they could um, shell them with these ships from the sea and attack them overland. Well, Grant caught a break. That February 1862, when he did attack, the Tennessee River was hot. This bird's eye view was really popular, and this ended the whole 19th century. There's a couple of places in town. There's one of the brew house, for example. I have a picture of this of Helen in the 1800s. Like looking down on it, which is a popular way to do things because it couldn't really do it. So this is looking down on that's Fort Donaldson. You see the problem with Fort Donaldson when the Tennessee River was hot. It flooded. The fort flooded right when Grant arrived. All their gunpowder was underwater. Fort Henry surrendered without a fight. Grant immediately became a hero. And all they had to do was cross the 10 mile, and there's Fort Donaldson over there and attack it. It was just perfect timing. Now, Fort Donaldson was a lot tough. This is a, paint, a picture of Fort Donaldson. It was on a hill. It had ramp forts. Fort Donaldson was a tough fort to capture. They tried to take it by storm, and they failed. They failed to take it. But they surrounded the Confederates, and the Confederates brought the supplies. So Fort Donaldson surrendered. But there's an important story that goes with Grant. The commander of Donaldson was a guy by the name of Buck. You didn't know his name. Just the commander of Donaldson, the Confederate commander. New Grant from the old army. They fought together in Mexico. He, the Confederates went out basically to offer his old friend, Buck was going to offer his old friend, surrender terms. These were really calm. The Confederates were surrounded, so basically they said, we'll really quit fighting. You can take Fort Donaldson. And usually a common term would be, we'll give up our weapons and you pardon us. That is all. It was a way to take it without any more bloodshed. These are really common in the 18th century. These are called conditions to a surrender. Grant ignored his friend and said, I will accept nothing but unconditional surrender. 
you surrender or we kill you all. How they surrender. But think how that fits in with his initials now. U.S. Grant, unconditional surrender Grant. He sounds like a man who fights. That would make Grant's reputation. Grant's reputation would be made. Unconditional surrender Grant. He did pardon. This would become important. We get to World War II, there will be an issue about conditional surrender. A little country called Japan was totally and completely defeated by the summer of 1860, or by the summer of 1945, but were not yet willing to surrender the way the United States wanted. They had a term to keep their empire. They were utterly and completely defeated. What would the United States do? Well, they had to quit fighting first. They were ready to surrender. The United States dropped two atomic bombs on them. And we ended up letting them keep their emperor anyways. Unconditional surrender. We'll talk about the atomic bomb later on, obviously. The commander of the Union forces in the West was old brains, Henry Halleck. He's the most famous Union general of the war that nobody knows. Partially because old brains... Who does that sound like? What other guy? Old brains. Old brains doesn't sound like old Hickory, does it? Or unconditional surrender. Who does he sound like? What was Winfield stopped? Bus and feathers. Old brains. And Halleck, actually, this really worked out well for him. Halleck go down the Mississippi, and what happened was this. Last thing for today. Once Fort Henry Fort Donaldson fell, the Union Army and Navy just sailed right down to Tennessee. That meant that every Confederate here was outflanked. And the Confederates retreated all of Western Tennessee. They gave up Nashville and Memphis without a fight. For the rest of the war, Western Tennessee is going to be in the hands of the United States. This was big. Please excuse the interruption. Black, we have a choice. Go for it. Please come to the main office for your high five award. Be responsible, be respectful, be a graduate. Thomas Gilboy, Damon Angolia, Ariel Lewis, Brianna Lewis, Grant Steichen, Victoria Slipich, Francis Tepper, and David Whitehead. Please come to the main office for your high five award. Thank you. Okay, one more thing. Please be read through. Oh, don't worry about the Gettysburg Address. We'll have to do that on Monday. Please be read through 685 to 701. Please be 685 to 701 by Wednesday. I will give you another reading assignment. Uh, the Gettysburg Address is coming up. We have to read through that. But what is due on Tuesday? And if you have any questions, I'll answer them on Monday. So let's put the desk together. Oh, no. See, it's a bridge. It's a bridge. No, you walk this way. You that's why it's a bridge. Part of the end. I don't know. Get them! Oh my! Perfect! Everyone has a limbo under the bridge. If you want to graduate, show me limbo on the way out. Yes! Everyone's running! 